thing instead uh, if you want to So we're starting a little bit early, which which will confuse the people who did the video streaming. And we don't have a mic, which will confuse it even more. Um, but you can hear us, right? So I, I think it's, uh, this, this, uh, the idea of this panel is really to get some feedback from you, yeah, from the audience. I mean, we, we know our ideas. <laughs> we, are se we are severely uh, entrenched. Um, <laughs> but we are open to, uh, to ideas, and I think it, it would be nice to get an idea of what the priorities are, right? I mean, if we, if we, if we look at the future of geeks, I think we, if we, you know, I can... I, I will state that Geeks is already a success. Um, it is just the start of it, but it's uh, it's amazing what is happening, and it's, you know we can build on it incrementally, which is very good for the future. Um, but what what should we focus on next, right? I mean, what's what's going to be what's the most important thing you think that is going to be, you know to drive new geeks in the future? So maybe I should ask the panel members first, and then you can react. <laughs> should I start? Yep. Okay. I think I'm going to just start straight with a conversation that we had a couple nights ago at the, at the bar. I think the most important. So, A, uh, I think we ought, to, we ought to just give a whole round of applause for this room, first of all, because... Yes. This is our second year of this, like, at the sub-conference, right? Like, uh, the, the amount of energy and stuff in this room is just nuts. Um, but I think, so... We, one of the things we were talking about the other night is uh, um, Geeks is great, we all love Geeks, but getting it in the hands of users is not necessarily very easy right now, right? One thing that I would love to see is be able to do apt get install Geeks, or even yum install Geeks, I guess, if you're on Fedora or whatever, right? Um, so uh, the, one of the big blockers on this is uh, um, that we have this slash GNU thing, and it's not part of the file system hierarchy standard. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> so, we, uh, uh, we, so I think that, um, so I guess the, I'm a little bit worried that I'm gonna monologue this, so maybe I have to figure out how to turn it over. The, uh, 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 I would really like to see geeks get packaged in Debian or et cetera, but we have to get over this pa slash GNU not being a file system hierarchy standard thing. Now we could do it one of a few things. We could just switch. We could switch over to slash opt. Just abandon the GNU thing. But I think that I'm looking at Ludovic's face. <laughs> and I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, we could. Um, and and so maybe I should hand it over to one of you two before I start. Just I feel like I'm monologuing and I feel rude about that on the panel. Oh, I really like listening to you. Oh, okay. Can, 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 okay. I'll just explain. I'll explain the. Um, so some of the ideas we came up with are kind of successively crazy. Well, the first one is switching to opt. That's not going to happen. Um, the second one is uh, um, we can do basically what Piotr demonstrated today and just rewrite. We can substitute. All packages, including we can uh, basically do a graft of all packages, including all the substitutes, um, all the grafted packages, um, and just rewrite them all from slash GNU slash store to slash op slash store, and then that might make it much easier to package in Debian or etc. The other crazy idea is to possibly have a user namespace. I think this was your idea, where people just in their .x session or whatever end up opening up a user namespace that basically remaps slash uh, opt slash store to slash gnu slash store. And that's kind of getting crazier. And then the last crazy one is to get it in the actual FHS, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. So that was a that was a long rant and not really a panel kind of conversation. So I guess I'm going to hand it over to the rest of the group to say, how do you think that we can get geeks better adopted in the world? <laughs> so I should point out that there, I see a Debian developer sitting there in the back of the room. So, you know, maybe for this particular point, we could also think about the social approach to it. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so getting geeks into into Debian and other free distros is one thing. Uh, I think I'm also personally interested in having you know great use cases for geeks. So we've we've seen uh, talks and discussions about a few of them. So one of them is high performance computing, uh, where I think people are really needing. So it's really a niche in terms of users, but people are really in need of a solution. And Geeks seems to be satisfying in a number of ways, so that's one thing I'd like to push. 
And then we have this GeekSSD thing, which is pretty cool, I think. And uh, to make it even cooler in a number of, of use cases, there is Geeks Deploy. And so uh, Chris has been looking at it. And before, David Thompson also started toying with uh, a way. So I should say what Geeks Deploy is, I guess. Right, so Geeks Deploy. So you have GeekSSD where you run Geek System uh, Reconfigure, Geek System VM, and you get one machine, right? One operating system instance. And the idea with Geeks Deploy is to allow you to actually deploy GeekSSD on a number of machines, like on a, on a cluster, on a network, something. So it, for those of you familiar with NixOps, uh, this would be roughly the, the Geeks equivalent to NixOps. That's, that's the idea. And so I think the ability to deploy a, a whole bunch of machines in a reproducible fashion is really one of the killer apps that we could have in the forthcoming future. It's hard to be the third person to say something novel. Uh, so I, I work in uh, as a system administrator in an HPC environment. So for me, HPC is kind of important. Uh, not just personally, but I think if we can make people, system administrators, realize that Geek solves their problems in scientific computing and they pick it up once, they're unlikely to change away from it again. Uh, so for me, this is a personal priority to get it adopted because as, as soon as we have uh, people in science depending on Geeks, they cannot get away with not supporting it. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I ended up supporting geeks. <laughs> <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about here. Uh, I, I don't really know if um, AppGet installed geeks is, is really an issue, if this is really a problem. Uh, are there actually people who are interested in geeks who shy away from using it because they can't just app get installed? Oh, what? Yeah. Oh. Hi, I'm Irush. Is there any problems? Yeah. Can I respond to that? Can Please do. Uh, okay. <laughs> so what I would love to do is have Media Goblin's default way to get up and running uh, for um, is either that you have a dev package or like for Debian type users, but if you want to develop, um, you know, for Geeks users, they'll obviously already have it for GeekSSD users, right? But if you're developing on something like Debian or Fedora or something like that, I would love people to be able to do geeks environment l geeks.scm. And right now, we have to either ask somebody to drop this binary install thing, which I think is not very nice for a lot of people. Like, it technically works. But there's good reasons to feel uncomfortable doing that, right? Um, and like, if I could just say, oh, it's just like any of these other package managers you can just install out of the box on Debian, that would be huge. Like, I could just say, it's so easy to just pick up Geeks, you have it already, right? And that would be, it, I know for my use cases at least, it would be big. Uh, it's been a while since I used Debian, but uh, I know that Ubuntu people use, what is it called, PPAs, right? Mm -hmm. and that's a one-liner that you, that you execute to add an additional repository that you trust, and then you can do app get install. Would that be sufficient, or does it really have to be uh, official? I mean, we could, that's, okay, so that's another option as well, you know. I, I mean, I think that that's another option to getting things installed. But I think it would be even better if we could have Geeks shipped with Debian itself so that, because not everybody is going to want to edit their PPA list. Yeah, so the question really is what is the growth path that we are looking for, right? I mean, if you, if you make it easy for people to install software, that's one thing, and I, I agree with Chris that's possible. Um, the Debian uh, community has been highly resistant to, uh, you know, including package managers in their in their systems. If, but they have package managers, you know, for for languages, yeah, you know, like PyPy and, uh, and all that. Um, so you know, you, it, it, I suppose it's it, it could be it could be worked on, right? But it's going to probably be a long haul. Um, but yeah, the, the question is also, you know, what what type of user do you want to attract? I mean, you really want to attract users that start contributing to gigs. 
right? Which which tend to be uh, people who, who develop software. Um, no, there are, I was going to say, I mean, there, there's the. I'm just pointing at <laughs> Yeah, I'm just pointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward. Um, I mean, the other, the other thing that I was going to say is that what I really like the idea about is this kind of thing that David Thompson, I think, as well, has, has been working on is the container idea, the, you know, Geeks system container which I think could be a massive thing in terms of like, well, web service development, um, I guess for media company, but also like for stuff that I'm doing, it's just kind of anything that requires multiple services to be running, it would be lovely to just do it in a container. And I think there are communities out there, I definitely think the community I'm working in um, would, is still looking for a really nice development environment. Um, but going to them and saying, okay, you just need to kind of first set up, you know, geeks in a complicated way, and then you can use this, amazing. That basically, you know, why change the current development environment that they have, which works, but is a hassle for another one that is also a hassle and then also works in many better ways, but also just works, you know? So I think in that sense, and th those are people that develop software, but they're also users. Um, and it's a niche, I think, that, that would definitely, we could fill. Yeah. So many of us talk about how we love that geeks could be a replacement for things like Docker and stuff like that, right? But we don't expect that every user of Docker um, has to be a Docker contributor in order to be able to make use of those features, which I think is kind of ties in with what you're saying. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that everyone should... We want as many people as possible to send us patches and to learn Scheme and stuff like that, but I don't think that it should be a prerequisite for taking advantage of all of geeks' things. Currently, actually, this happens already. Many people send us patches. Uh, Too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good problem to have, but it actually is also a problem because um, managing all these patches, making sure that uh, nobody is left out. Uh, <laughs> that's actually one of the points on on our list here. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to make sure that people continue contributing when their contributions don't end up being part of Geeks eventually. Um, maybe you want to say something about this? Because I lost the train of thought. <laughs> well, this is something that audience members can help with, right? We, 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 we could use help with people reviewing patches on the list. And it, reviewing a patch can, for the first time, actually be as easy as, assume, well, once you get a Geeks development environment set up, um, actually trying to apply the patch and just see if it works on your system, right? And that doesn't require a lot of scheme expertise. And in fact, I think Ludovic and a few others have had talks about plenty of people don't have scheme expertise when they start with Geeks and pick it up as they go, right? So as a call out to people in the audience, that's something you can do. Um, actually, I want to make one more call out for something that people can do to, 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 develop, to push along one of the things that we talked about previously, which is making Geeks Deploy happen. If anybody in the audience is interested in getting Geeks SD running on like commodity VPS hosting type things, that would push along our work tremendously and document it. And if you can do that, that'll help us move along in the server space dramatically. And that's something... You know, I'm sure there are a number of people in this audience whose skills could ap apply to that. Yeah, and another one is uh, is adding uh, support to you know inter continuous integration systems like Travis. Yeah, if, if people could just you know uh, deploy a package, say Ruby, you know, run their software, do the test, run in the testing environment, that would also be a very hi a highly visible project. You know, because uh, you know, I think 50% uh, developers in open source software are actually using Travis now. We throw another one to the audience. Yeah, we can ask. So, does somebody have a question about the future of geeks and et cetera that they'd like to ask, or a strongly worded opinion? <laughs> so, one thing that um, I thought about when you were talking about installers and the Travis is some installer that can run as a like a shell script or a batch script and can run in an automated way. So, the people just installing Geeks who want to just install Geeks, that would be useful. Even on Debian, I think, it would mean they wouldn't have to um, use the manual if they didn't want to. 
And also, perhaps for things like Travis, it would also be useful because you could just run it first and then do anything do any with peaks, possibly. <coughs> yep. Right, so, so the question is about how we could facilitate the installation of gigs, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so currently if you're using the, the so-called binary table, which is a pre-compiled gigs, you have to then go to the manual and do each of the steps one by one and make sure you don't forget anything. And that's, yeah, that's kind of not super convenient. And you're suggesting that we should have a script that does that by default. Well, right. It's available as an option. Yeah. And yeah, that's probably a good idea. Actually, it's been discussed a couple of times, and I think we probably should do it. Although there is the the problem that you know we are shipping a big binary, which is already. I mean, I can imagine that some people are not comfortable with it. And so, if we also tell them, well, just run this shell script and don't worry, it's going to be fine. Just you know, the, just the, the perception could be pretty bad. So it's a bit like curl pipe sh, right? Um, so we need to be careful, I think, about this also. Can we get a quick poll of the room? I'd love to see how people's experiences of getting up and running with Geeks slash Geeksist, I guess, um, would be. So here's the range that it's going to be. Very good experience, pretty good, and could use some work. All right, so let's go with the, the, the very good. How many hands go? Wait, how many people are running Geeks or Geeks SD? Can you raise your hands on that first? Whoa, locks. Okay. All right, now let's go for the very good. Oh, man. Okay, well, that means that's a, that's a product now. Um, okay, so um, now that's six. So let's, uh, um, okay, Geeks first. Uh, very good. Okay. Uh, pretty good. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about could use some work? <laughs> okay. What about Geeks SD, which I think is a different beast? So, very good. How about pretty good? How about could use some work? Okay. So I think we're seeing that Geeks SD is, is, is considerably harder right now. My friend calls Geeks SD installation experience Gen 2 for adults, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say after that, so I'm just going to randomly pass the microphone over. <laughs> yeah, so what's the next topic here? <laughs> My experience, and this may have changed a little, my experience, because like, the last time I ran Geeks on Debian is now like over a year ago. But my experience was that setting up Geeks on Debian, I found easier, but then kind of making sure that all the environment variables are set and everything kind of works nicely, that is way harder. Mm -hmm. In Geeks SD, the installation procedure was a bit tricky, <laughs> but now it's running like it's, you know, I don't have to worry about anything, basically. That's absolutely That's true. right. So the complications also arise in different places. Mm. Yeah, so what I did, uh, someone killed a, uh, a recipe for a Debian package, and I changed that also for Ubuntu, and I just built that and uh, installed it, so that's easier than, like you said, it's easier to just go Geeks SD because everything just works. Mm. Yeah, Localis is also a nice one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> True. Geeks does take care of a couple of environment variables for packages that you install. Yeah. But that's not sufficient, right? There's this, this little bit of uh, SSL stuff, for example, or the, the, the local, oh, yeah. Certificates. Yeah. Yeah. Certificates. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's gone really better, I think, because now it actually tells you. It, it only tells you things uh, for packages that have search path specifications. And. Um, is that not right? That's right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and this doesn't cover everything, which means there's always some manual intervention required, and and that kills it a bit. So in my experience, when we are using Geeks as such uh, on the cluster, uh, on, the, on the cluster computer environment and uh, on workstations, and I, I try to make sure to provide a file that people can source that sets up the environment variables. Maybe we can provide something similar to that. Uh, I would really like to uh, move away from the need to do this manually. Because it trips me up as well, too. Uh, as well, too. 
<laughs> Should have had that coffee. <laughs> so one one topic we talked about talking about here that I definitely want to make sure we don't miss is about community. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we're hoping that we can engage with the community since we're have community in front of us. Um, but I think that there are some things that, to me, it feels like we could do a lot better at. I don't think we're as sufficiently diverse as we could be. And I feel like there are probably, I mean, my experience, I've, I've worked with projects that have really struggled in that regard and that have done better than average, you know. And, uh, um, and, I, and I think Lisp also has a reputation for being like curmudgeon-y people who think they have everything right, and then that kind of pushes a lot of people away. Um, and it's partly because, I mean, we do have a lot of things right, and so it's easy to be smart. <laughs> uh, but, I, but, I, I, but I mean, look at Clojure and Racket right now, which are like doing way better than like traditional lists. Um, and we definitely could be better. I mean, one, personally, one thing that I think could be improve things a lot is, you know, if we engage specifically with some groups like Outreachy or something like that, although that would require us having the funds to do that. Uh, but but I'm, I'm really interested in what we can do to improve community and to, to lower the barrier, um, especially for the groups of people we don't currently have. Um, mm. I don't know where to go from there, but Ricardo. I have a comment. So, oh. so yesterday in the, in the main theater, there was a talk on how to improve all ages access into your community. And one of my favorite suggestions they did is you can bring younger people into your community by asking them to do YouTube instructions. Because a lot of people can't code but want to share their experience on, on using something as an operator. Oh, go with your audiences. Uh, so. So you mean the project could share videos, like giving instructions? Is, is that what you want? You, want, you, you want people to remain in your community. You want people of all ages to contribute and then stay. But a lot of times, people will come and say, how can I help? And you'll say, well, unless you're a coder, you can't help. Right. So you never want to drive away effort. And so one thing that you can ask younger people to do, uh, because it's part of their culture, is to, to video. <laughs> well, I just realized about one of more video stuff. So, but, you, no. oh yeah, so yeah, precisely. I had I had written an item about sharing the workload, and uh, it's all about the, all the kinds of tasks that we have to do somehow, and many of them are non-technical. Like, I mean, we have things like like the website, like people posting about what they are doing with gigs, which doesn't have to be you know super sophisticated, and videos yeah that's that's definitely one thing like to help people discover gigs and discover what it does what it's used for how it helps and yeah i agree that we should yeah try to make it easier to discover what people can do in these areas yeah, <laughs> yeah. um speaking about community um I would probably like to say thank you. Like you've, you've got a very good community or support. Like the mailing list is very nice, and uh, meeting you here personally is very nice. And um, what what I'm missing from community is like a web front end, like a like a GitLab or something. I, I, there are some discussions about it. So what what's the state currently about this one? <laughs> Ouch. Um. Well, I can go. I can go. Uh, well, I was talking about this with some, with some other individuals last night, including Alex. Uh, we were talking about. Uh, um, so one of the problems is is that like, um, for example, before like I got into geeks, I hated dev bugs. Like I hate it, right? Like, and that's a bug tracking system we use, and it's like all email based, right? And like I was like, and I was trying to use a web interface to find things, and I'm like, this is the worst. Like this web interface is terrible. Like how do I manage it? Well, then I found out that there's a great Emacs mode, which is what everybody else uses, <laughs> and like it's just like beautiful. And it's like, well, now I don't want to use anything else, right? So, but like this is like a traditional, especially in GNU problem, is that we have all these things that like once you pass 
this very high barrier to entry. It couldn't be better. <laughs> but like, you're like, you're like, yeah, just like, I promise you you'll love it. Just run up this mountain. It's very tall, but you'll feel so great when you get to the top. You're so nice. <laughs> Maybe make videos about using Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> videos help me in using Emacs. But yeah. I tried for three times to get into Emacs. Uh, the third time, I, uh, I I never got out anymore. You know, uh, but the first few times, I thought everybody's talking about it. Mm -hmm. I should use this too. Uh, and it just didn't stick because defaults matter as well. And uh, I, I, I agree that. Uh, debugs could be more discoverable. I also find it hard to use, actually, and I think I'm the target audience. For, <laughs> yeah, and, and the the mail-based uh, workflow that we have, sending in patches, uh, it does. While it does have a lot of advantages, uh, one of which is that you do not need to have some account on some web application uh, where you have to log in and then click around and do things. Uh, you can just send an email. While this is great about it, it also makes it hard to keep track of things. It makes it hard to keep, keep track of patches that you've sent in. It, it, but you can integrate this with org mode, I guess. And uh, <laughs> right. But I, I agree that there's there's a need for something uh, that combines those two worlds, that makes it possible that, that we don't have to change too much in, in the way that uh, our established workflows work for us and that other people find it discoverable as well. Yes, uh, this is actually quite amazing because um, Gix is, as, as a system, as a packaging system, is, is really approachable. You know, it's, it's much easier than doing Debian packaging. I dabbled in that too and I gave up. You know? <laughs> yeah, so the amazing thing about Gix is that you actually can write packages quite, you know, low profile, easily get it done, get it tested and run. But then you hit a barrier because you have to submit it to you know the the trunk, and I've you know I've successfully got some packages in, so I'm proud enough to, to say <laughs> that it works. Um, but you know it's, I find it so hard and tedious that I actually don't do it at this point. And the question really to 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 the maintainers of Geeks is you know can we not find a way that we you know uh, please both please both audiences? One is the you know the highly professional I should say one that has gone over the mountain you know and they're they're, they're happily above there somewhere. But there's also people that you know just uh, you know would like to use something like GitHub, yeah. Submit a patch, have somebody look at it, you know, and and get some response. It doesn't necessarily even have to go into 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 mainline. Yeah, the the point really is that you want to get, make it easy for people to get comments, yeah, and, and encourage them actually to to continue working on those patches until the point that they're actually ready to get it to trunk. So part of the challenge with this is that this is a boy, it would be great to have a big complicated tool that doesn't exist and like everybody is busy in the community already with our own big complicated tools that do exist and take a lot of work, right? So like, so I know that, uh, I remember, I can't remember what it is, it's a conservancy uh, like software hosting thing, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Uh, they, like, they were really interested in having something that both has an API that you could like use in Emacs and stuff, but then also has like a web interface and stuff like that, but like that project doesn't have like, also, I don't know if it has a lot of momentum right now. Um, so, like, Calathea, I think that's it, right? Uh, um, so, like, these things are really important and useful. Right now, we're stuck between choices that seem very binary, right? Like, they're either, you've got a very, I don't know what the answer is for that. Yeah, so regarding tooling, I think there's a kind of a cultural issue. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that, I mean, some of us are kind of used to their current workflow and everything, so it makes it harder to move to something else in general. Um, that said, I mean, I can understand that it's it's not necessarily trivial. It's like that big mountain, definitely, for people who are not used to it. Uh, so, yeah, so one option would be to use, to have some sort of an, like an instance of GitLab that we could use and test drive. You know, we don't have maybe to switch directly to something, but we could try out something right and maybe have two systems at the same time while we figure out how things work and whether it's good for us and uh, I've been told by uh, an Emacs person that GitLab is not that bad even for, for 
for the kind of person like me who likes to do things in Emacs and have email and stuff. So I don't know, maybe it, maybe it's an option. I I guess we just need to try out and yeah. But it's, yeah, it's also about you know trying out an, another tool and that's quite a lot of work also. So that's not trivial. So yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, why not have two systems? And one, call one, uh, you know, the, the incubator or, or the teacher or the helper, you know, where, where people actually learn. And it could, it could actually be managed by different people. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Right. I think you're talking more about processes than, than tools, right? Yeah. Um, I think we, I mean, if when someone post patches to the mailing list, so definitely way too often it takes time to get an answer. I completely agree. Uh, but most of the time there are people who try to do some sort of mentorship and uh, it's, I think it's, it's quite good I would say. But obviously it doesn't really scale also. And I mean just, just because we have two different tools or two different repos let's say doesn't mean that there will be double the number of people to actually do that work and that's that's yeah, that's a scalability issue. And we also don't want to end up in the situation where we have two completely disjoint systems that are very right. important. Um, yeah. So wait, do we want to jump onto an? I feel like we've covered that one pretty yeah. well. Do we have uh, other? Well, wait. Well, I just maybe want to say like two things. Like first of all, I mean. I mean, this is not just a geeks problem, right? I mean, this is a this is a hard problem. Like Debian has this too, right? But, but also, like you know, the, the, the project that I work in with work, like we've got a bug tracker, and there are tons of patches that just sit there, mm. and just people don't get around to them. And especially people who are not necessarily like whose first patches it is, were not really known in the community. Like there is this kind of element of like you know someone, therefore you kind of might look at the patch earlier. There is that element, and that's kind of just part of like large projects. It, it is a hard problem to a certain extent. Tools definitely help, so we need to investigate this. But it's, yeah. I, I, was, I thought it was worth saying that it is. And a and hard problem. I I do think that it is mm -hmm. it is easy sometimes to kind of obsess over believing that tools will fix the problem, when that's not necessarily true. I mean, I do think we should be working on it, right? But like. I mean, Media Goblin has a lot of issues in its tracker, and it has a web interface bug tracker, right? And we, uh, and if you, the average GitHub repository has no shortage of issues and pull requests, right? So, I mean, we, there's a lot we can do to make it easier, but of course, it's easy to kind of put so much faith in if we could only get better tools, and that especially happens with programmers, right? Because we love tools, right? So, um, but a lot of it is also social too. It's there, and it's not one or the other; it's both, I think. The other thing I wanted to oh, sorry, you go first. Yeah, I wanted to. Oh, sorry, there was someone yeah, behind you who was at the hand of. We'll do you after. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm an Enix user. So there's not just lots of overlap between Geeks and Enix, and there seems to be lots of work at once. Is there any um, plan of making this easier to interrupt, like a standard to be able to use one package from one to one in the other, or this, you mentioned Nixon, which is already a fair, very, fairly good tool. It would be a real shame to redo it from scratch and get I, I think. Should we add the the Nix language to as a as on top of the Guile virtual machine <laughs> as a solution? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the question is about how we can avoid overlap between Nix and, and Geeks or share no, work. Sharing. sharing work, yeah. Uh, that's a difficult question because, I mean, so, so the low level part is the same, right? So in theory, we have derivation and Nix has derivation, and that's the same thing. Uh, but then, it's not just a technical issue, right? Like, Gix is building a fully free distribution, for instance, whereas NixPKG is doing something different, which is, I mean, an important project also, but, you know, we have different thing and different views on how to do things, like even packaging or that kind of thing. So we, can, we cannot ignore this part of the problem, right? It's not just technical. Um, but then, yes, I definitely think that we should, at the very least, share ideas if not code. We, I, we actually already share code. Uh, I mean, we've been using the, the build daemon from Nix and it's, it's wonderful. I mean, Geeks wouldn't exist without Nix in the first place, right? 
but yeah, sharing ideas at the very least is something we can do, and it's it's cheap, right? And I'm sure we have a lot to learn from each other. And we geeks people have a lot to learn from NixOS, obviously because NixOS and NixOps is more mature. So yeah, we should talk more. I would say. <laughs> you you had a question, so, and we had a confusing pointing thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not a question. Uh, it's a little story. I learned Max with a video by Pico, and I had been trying for years. And then I've been told that Pico, now it's not called Pico anymore, it's been bought by someone, I don't, I don't remember exactly, but I've been told that they do not guarantee the freeness of the JavaScript on their site. So, yeah. Uh, so, freeness of JavaScript is definitely a, a concern of mine. Um, I, I the what a lot, but part of the problem is is that the web is also a large ocean that I don't have a lot of control over how much of it has free JavaScript. You know, so um, I mean, you know, I guess the best thing you can do in that circumstance is contact them and encourage them to free their JavaScript or, you know, submit it to a media goblin instance or something. Uh, the, <laughs> um, but, but anyway, uh, are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah. One of my concern was uh, ability. Uh, I mean, if you want, if, if I just wanted to modify EPC posts, for example, to add like a or something, uh, I don't necessarily want to edit and reconfigure to get it done. So I was, I was wondering if you you uh, would accept something, a, a command like sudo edit, but like we accept it, we just edit the file, uh, put it in the store, and just go around. Right, so yeah, I have mixed feelings because. Um, repeat the question we Right, so the question is about how. How about having tools in GeekSSD that would allow you to quickly hack something as opposed to having to run Geek System Reconfigure, right? Um, yeah, S so I think, you know, the functional 100% reproducible model is inherently very static and, and a bit rigid too, right? I mean, we do Geek System Reconfigure because we want to make sure we have the exact same system as if we had installed from scratch, right? But at the same time, I'm also a big fan of, of Gazer and Ripples and life hacking. And I'm also not fully satisfied with the fact that we have to go through this process every time we just want to make a single change. I would like to have something like, if you're familiar with Emacs, like control meter x, which means evaluate this expression right now. Uh, but I, I mean, it's a hard problem. I, I don't know how to merge the two requirements. Uh, so, I mean, I agree with you, we need something, I just not, don't know exactly what it should look like. I don't know. I can only say that in, in my experience so far, I really like to reconfigure things. Uh, I always, uh, you're talking about Geeks SD, right? Yeah. Um, I've never actually hacked on the operating system uh, as it is in the store in order to uh, create some effect. You know, uh, because I really like the guarantees that uh, a reconfigured system gives me. Um, this is what always annoyed me about traditional system configuration is that you make a change here and you make a change there and then you start forgetting exactly what has changed and you try to recreate this and there's just no way to to be sure that you recreated the, the exact same steps. And uh, I feel that this should be a thing of the past. Uh, so if reconfiguration is considered an obstacle, um, we would have to figure out why that is. Is it too slow? Can we make it faster? Uh, I'd rather not uh, soften the, you know, the uh, the boundaries that we have. Uh, but that's just 
Me personally, no. I do, however, hack on uh, on packages that were already built. Because sometimes rebuilding everything from source, and you know that there's really just one, uh, like e Emacs, right? When, when you're hacking on Emacs, and you really just want to play with uh, what's there. Uh, I uh, I did that before, uh, just making the store writable again. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't do this regularly, all right? <laughs> but I can understand the need for, uh, I can understand the desire to do this, but uh, it goes against everything that we believe in. <laughs> I will atone for this. I'm afraid you lost your credibility. <laughs> I think, yes? Oh. Maybe There's a question over there. Yes. Right. That's an additional comment. Um, yes. Also, a big plus is to keep your system configuration under version control. Yep. So yep. You just check line, hit commit, and if the system reconfigure, it really does take you a second that you have a new system. Yeah. yeah. And you can remember what it is. Yeah, as an example, our build farm, hydware.gnu.org, so it's not running GigSSD because it dates back to the days where you could barely install packages with gigs, and so it's running Triscoll, I think, and we've been hacking around on that machine to the point that we don't really know what's going on there, <laughs> and so we are finally switching to a new build farm front end, which is called Bayfront, which is running GigSSD right from the start, and I can tell that, yes, having everything under version control is, is wonderful. We have the sky. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask something regarding the community participation <laughs> and uh, precisely about the peer to peer project and uh, if it's still on the agenda the idea of uh, package sharing and which is the rationale, which is the status. Is that the GNUNA stuff? Right. Yeah. So, Yes, yeah, so the question is about uh, sharing packages over uh, in a B2B fashion. So there was a GSOC project on this topic about using GNU-Net's file sharing component and pushing binaries to GNU-Net instead of uh, using HTTP, basically. And that's, I think that's something many of us still want to see happening, but it's just that technically there are still obstacles uh, one of them is that GNU-Net doesn't yet have a stable release process, and uh, so that makes things a bit more difficult. Uh, right, but yeah, for instance, during GSOC, uh, the, the student wrote bindings for this, for GNU-Net, uh, guide bindings, and also some sort of a proof of concept that would allow you to push binaries to GNU-Net and to kind of retrieve them, but it was, yeah, a proof of concept and again, as GNU-Net is currently a moving target, uh, we don't seem to be able to make much progress on this one. I think we're technically over time, but maybe but we can still excuse uh, having at least one more question that probably goes to Ludovic more than anyone. But, you know, uh, oh, no, wait, Ludovic and Ricardo, you're both maintainers. Um, but uh, I see 1.0 in 2017 on there. What do we need next to get to 1.0? What, what, are, what are the next steps? I can just read it. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one uh, thing that is, uh, I think we would all agree is bad about geeks at this point is geeks pull. Yeah. Uh, and it's also because none of us are using it. <laughs> so we don't feel the pain as often as we should to change it. And geeks pull needs to become better. Geeks pull is. Uh, uh, is anyone using Geeks Pool here? I occasionally. By accident. <laughs> <laughs> because once you type Git Pool and. No, I copy paste on the documentation. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Geeks Pool is, is a very naive implementation right now. It gets the latest version of Geeks, uh, compiles that, and creates a symlink so that the version of Geeks you're using is the latest version. It's actually not even true. Uh, yeah. Part of that, right? It's the, it's the guy part of it. But it's also, yeah, it's not as safe as we'd like either. Yeah. 
Uh, so for 1.0, gigs per should be extended such that not only it becomes actually usable, uh, but we've been thinking about this uh, a lot, we've discussed this a lot, that we would like to be able to uh, go back in time um, with Geeks so that you can say I would like to have Geeks at this particular version without having to uh, use low level tools like Git right? checking out an old version uh, and running make there and then using that to build an old version of a piece of software that was available in Geeks' history uh, Geeks Pro should be the, the front end for that so that you can have multiple versions of Geeks that you can switch to and from uh, and that relates closely to the idea of having channels. <clears throat> to Geeks Poll's credit, I think it's not obvious how bad it is to most users, um, but that's also to its detriment, that they don't know how bad things are under the hood and how much they should be worried about. Well, okay, wait, I shouldn't say that out loud. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Geeks Poll. Yeah, so, yeah, just, so, just to, to give an idea of how bad it is, uh, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna scare off half our audience, we're gonna yeah. run away. But, uh, I mean, fortunately, it's not just our problem, it's a problem that we share with pretty much any project that uses Git nowadays, which is that Git's pool is essentially fetching stuff from Git, but it does not authenticate what it's fetching, right? So, like we're fetching from Savannah, but if there's a man in the middle attack, you're fetching a different set of packages and you don't even notice, right? And that's, that's a bit of a problem. But it turns out that everyone has this problem with Git. I mean, so there is work. People are starting to realize that it's kind of a problem. We need to be able to authenticate uh, checkouts, but there is no simple solution, right? Well, that's the next item on the list. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that's something we need to work on. And for example, people, distro people have been looking at, I mean, there is this thing called the update framework, TUF, and it's great, but it's really biased towards distros that have, you know, source on one hand and binaries and repos on the other hand. Like in...